Good morning, everyone. A very big welcome to our talk this morning. And we're very fortunate to have Charlie here with us. And uh, Charlie is the uh, national coordinator of all the uh, centres in Australia and uh, a very wonderful speaker. And he speaks all over the world in all different countries. And we're very, very lucky to have him with us. So Charlie's going to speak about overthinking and how we can change that. Thank you, Charlie. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so thank you so much, Sally. <clears throat> and it's really so lovely to be here in the Blue Mountains at this um, absolutely magnificent retreat center. And I think all of you out there have been here and you know how beautiful it is. And I just hope the, the atmosphere is oozing through the screen so you can feel the beautiful, peaceful vibrations. And also we have lovely flowers here from the garden as well. How much has our world changed in just the last few weeks? Our whole world has changed. Our lives have been turned upside down. And we're just fed this constant stream of information from the world media about the scenario that's just unfolding minute by minute, day by day. And where does it all land? Where does all this information, the stories land? It all lands here in my mind. And often so much thinking, so much sorting out going. And I think the question on the minds of so many of us is, what will happen? What will be the ultimate outcome of this? And that question sort of is increasing our levels of anxiety day by day. And our anxiety is just driving this already often overactive mind. I don't think there's ever a more important time for us to really say, well, there's a shutdown. I can't do the things I've done before. This is an incredible time for me to really learn more about who I am. What is the greatest influence on my thinking? and really maybe start to, with love and wisdom, take back the authority, my internal authority, which often we have lost. And you know, an image I have for myself was about our minds today. I saw a cartoon some years ago, and there was a man in this cartoon. He had a big zip right around his head. <laughs> And a big hand came and unzipped his head and opened his skull like a suitcase. And then you peered in and you could see inside his head in his mind. <laughs> and in his mind was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of little scenes of people and situations. Some were talking, some were hugging, some were arguing, some were fighting. And I thought it's a great image for our, for our mind today. It seems that you know, we have so much unfinished business in our mind. There's so much, so many stories of the past, so many thoughts and feelings that just remain unresolved and just sit. And so all of that is just constantly feeding my thinking. And, you know, I sometimes feel that, you know, we are so educated about the world outside, but it's like we're so uneducated about my inner world. And when, you know, the mind is just going at this constant pace, I sometimes ask the question too, what do you think is driving our thinking? What is it that's really driving it? Is it the speed of life? Yes, life is very fast. You know, I think that is one factor, but I tend to feel our mind has become so overactive 
that we're creating a world to entertain this overactive mind. And the thing that's the, the, the heart of it is the telephone. Now, if I was to ask you how many seconds, not minutes, seconds does it take after you wake up before you look at your phone <laughs> and scroll through the messages and that triggers more and more and more thoughts. And then the whole day, you know, it's become our closest companion. And we go from screen to screen to screen, the phone to the computer to the TV. And I would say that the noise of life, the distractions, the busyness, the speed is sending us crazy. And yet we crave, I say, a stillness, an inner stillness inside, a mind at rest, a calm mind. To me, that is really what a quality life is about when I can create the quality of thoughts I want and I dictate the atmosphere in my mind rather than the world dictating to me how I should feel. But I think the noise, the busyness, the speed, the distractions have a purpose. And they stop me from looking really deep inside to see actually who am I? Who am I really and what? is the real meaning and purpose of life. What is a fulfilling life really about? And I know that many of us, at different times, we see I'm caught in the rat race, I'm caught up in the game, my phone's ruling me, I'm in this, rack, this incredible life of activity. And I think I'll turn off my phone, I'll chill out for a while, I'll just take it easy. And sometimes that's just such a sweet feeling. But in other times, it's like when I stop and I go inside, there's, there's an emptiness there. There's like a big void. And sometimes I would even say like a, a big deep sadness inside, just this really deep sadness, like a meaninglessness. What is all of this about? What's the meaning of life and what I'm really doing? And it's not comfortable. So how do we feel that discomfort? What do we do? We just <clears throat> fill it with more busyness. Just keep running. Because the more I keep running and my mind's on the surface, I can't really think too deeply what is really important. So I go off and I buy another, another phone, more apps, and it just feeds you know, the continually overactive mind which doesn't really allow me, I think, to really enjoy a quality life. And, you know, sometimes I've thought about this a lot, that all the education we have, did anyone ever teach you about your mind or how to manage your thoughts? Or if your mind is overactive, consciously have a strategy to cool it down? Because I don't think there's anything more important in life than to do that today. Because the mind is the center of my life. My whole life meets in my mind. It's the place, the venue where my thoughts take place, my feelings, my reactions, my memories, my relationships. It's all played out here. And my perceptions as well. The way I interpret everything depends on really the quality of my thinking and the wisdom I have in my mind. And this mind is such an extraordinary thing. And I think <clears throat> there's been a lot of research in recent years. And once I was actually in Canberra, and I met a man who was the head of, for the center of the mind at ANU, the Australian National University. He was an American from New York quite an incredible character. And what he was telling me was that this thing, which is creating all the technologies, like the one we're just meeting with now, he said, is the part of science we know least about. It's amazing, isn't it? The thing creating all the stuff, we don't know so much about it. Some scientists say that this mind creates 70,000 unique thought patterns in a waking day. 
And I often quote that figure, but I have no idea how they actually counted all those thoughts. Another scientist says that you can actually think about 500 words a minute, but you only speak about 125. So even as I'm speaking to you, you know, I'm thinking what I'll say next. I'm watching the few people behind the camera here. <laughs> you know, I'm aware of different things going on around me. So you're in psychology, they say, your mind can be aware on seven different levels at any given moment. So in a way, your mind is like a thought factory. It's constantly creating thought and that is the whole foundation of your life and the quality of your life. We put so much time and energy into my body, giving it rest, eating well, exercising. What do I do for my mind? And I would say this world scenario that all of us are facing, each and every one of us has to reassess, in a sense, my life and how I'm going to approach my life from this moment. There is no more important time to really learn about my mind and maybe take more control of my thinking, not based on force, but based on going deep into who I am. So what I'd like to do is just <clears throat> invite you for a few moments of meditation. And I think all of you know this beautiful room in the Blue Mountains and outside it's lovely and sunny. I'm going to invite you into this room and I'm going to speak a few thoughts and really consciously begin to relax. Just feel yourself relaxing. Always consciously feel yourself calming down. And focus your attention to the center of your life, which is your mind. My whole life happens in my mind. Each part of my life will enter my mind. And if I don't have wisdom and things aren't resolved, they sit there. and stagnate and create unhappiness. And just visualize your mind like a sacred place. Just hold the image of your mind like a crystal clear bowl of water so still, so calm, so clear. But there's gateways into my mind, my ears. I hear comments from people. I am criticized. I let it through my ears into my mind and it drives my thinking. Another gateway is my eyes. I see bad behavior. I see injustice. I let it through my eyes and once again drives my thinking. 
and I begin to realize the external world is driving my mind. With all my education, I'm like a slave in my own mind. One word can trigger hours of overthinking. One situation means my mind can't stop. To begin the journey of resolving this overactive mind, I first have to take responsibility. Each thought is my creation. Each thought is my creation. People will be rude. People will be difficult. Situations will come. But ultimately, I have the choice of whether I overthink or not. If I just do one thing, I take full responsibility for each thought in my mind. It will change my life. Because when I find my mind complaining about you, criticizing, I've got to realize that I'm choosing to think like this. Just reflect. The whole quality of your life depends on the quality of your thinking. And if I keep blaming the world situation now, people around me, for how I'm feeling inside, I disempower myself. Spirituality is empowering myself to choose a quality of thought that helps me remain peaceful, that keeps me happy. I am responsible for how I feel. Often when we <clears throat> say things like that, that each thought's my creation, we say, yeah, yeah, I, I believe it, but they're like that, but this is happening, but what about this? You know, there's always like, you know, our inner world justifies why I overthink, why I create negative thinking, but actually really uh, the whole spiritual journey is taking my power back so that I remain in the state of self-awareness while the world around me changes. Life means change. I can't change out there, but I can change my response to out there, the way I think. 
You know, it's a well-known fact. Two people can do the same job. They're in the same office, sitting beside each other. They have the same desks. They have the same boss. They have the same sort of work they have to do. One is stressed out of their brain, and the next one's quite relaxed. So it's really how we think that really is creating. Because unless I fully take responsibility, then I'm always palming off my life and how I feel to things external to myself. I disempower myself. And for me, in my personal journey to understand my inner world, <clears throat> I've begun to think of it like a tree, a huge tree. And a tree has a seed, roots, it has a trunk, then it has branches, twigs, and leaves. The end product of a tree are the leaves, and the end product of my inner world are my thoughts. So a lot of us think, oh, my thoughts are sending me crazy. But we just look at the thoughts, like look at the leaves on the tree. But what has been actually influencing those leaves are the seed, the roots, the trunk, the branches, what's underneath that's feeding my mind. And if I really want to stop or even reduce my thinking, I've got to go much deeper. But let's actually start with the leaves and just look at our thoughts on the tree and <clears throat> look at a huge tree. There's like millions of leaves there. I think of the leaves of thoughts and little twigs like thought streams and feelings, which is my conscious mind here. And sometimes when I look at my thinking, I can see, oh, I have a really negative attitude to this person. So I try to pluck off, pluck out those thoughts. Or maybe I see the thoughts of self-dislike, you know, I don't like myself. Self-criticism, try to pluck out that thought. But what is the law of thoughts? My experience is pluck out one and 10 more grow. Is that true? <laughs> and I think, you know, I find a lot of people, they really genuinely want to think less, and yet they get quite frustrated sort of plucking. It's like you cherry pick off a few and a whole lot more grow. And as I began to look at this, just like I was sort of doing a little bit in that short meditation, alluding to this deep sort of feeling that I, the consciousness, sit in here and I connect through my sense organs to the world and how we are operating, even though we are so educated, is that what we hear, think, 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 think. What we see, think, think, think. So the everything outside is driving my thinking inside. So it's like I've surrendered my inner sovereignty to the external world. But let's go to the branches. <clears throat> the branches are feeding the thoughts. So what's in the branches <clears throat> is creating all the leaves. To me, I see the branches as my mental and emotional patterns many habitual patterns we have. And there's two huge branches inside all of us. And I would say one of them is like reflecting on the past and the other is projecting on the future. And we carry our whole story of the past inside of me. Things have happened. And so the mind just goes over and over. You know, some scientists say 70% of my thinking is from the past. I don't know how they measure that once again, but I wouldn't be surprised because the unfinished business, the unresolved hurts, the anger, the feelings sitting in my memory track keep coming back. And so that emotional pattern feeds the growth of so many more leaves on my thinking tree. The other one, which I think is growing incredibly fast at the moment, is projecting into the future, anxiety. We used to be able to plan life. I'm going to do this this year. I'm going overseas. I've booked my ticket. I'm going to get a new job. 
What can we do at the moment? We can almost only live for today. So, and then the thinking, what will happen? So these two huge branches, the what will happen branch too, thinking, thinking, thinking. And then there's a lot of sub-branches, which are my habitual mental emotional patterns, the perfectionist thinking. So many of us are perfectionists. Unless it's perfect, it's never good enough. So I have such high expectations, so I'm always disappointed. Disappointed in me, disappointed in you, disappointed in my boss. And I think it's a reality, but actually it's my high expectations feeding my thought tree. Even I would say paranoid thinking. <laughs> we all know a little bit of that. We start to read meaning into people's behavior and what they say. You know, they say one little tiny thing and I think, oh, they're trying to tell me something. You know how we, the mind just embellishes and grows. Or even, you know how sometimes you have a daily video you've recorded in your mind of your mistakes or the things you haven't done well. And you, you know, sometimes you play back, oh, oh no, you know, feeding my mind. Or even the daily video of somebody else, all their mistakes and things you don't like. So, you know, these mental and emotional patterns, habitual patterns, paranoid things, overthink, just feed the thought tree even more. But what is actually feeding, feeding the branches? It's the trunk. And the wonderful thing about our consciousness is, and I, I find it really such a fascinating thing, that the mind is like a screen. Now, you're seeing me here. See the beautiful picture behind me of the Supreme Soul. Imagine that's a screen. And all the data that your mind collects through what you see, what you hear, is thrown up on that screen. So all the data through the senses of life, what people say, what do, is thrown up on the screen, and you're watching that data, and you, you try to make sense of that data. You make a decision. That part of you is called the intellect. And it's just like as I'm speaking, a part of you is saying, oh, I like that, I don't like that, I agree with that, I don't agree with that. That's your intellect. So all the data is on the screen of your mind, the intellect's observing, and then it makes a decision, I'll do this. You act, you speak. Every single thing you do is recorded in the database of your subconscious. So we're all sitting in our homes, watching this video, maybe quietly, and yet you carry this extraordinary database in your subconscious. Freud said that 70 to 80% of all the influence of my behaviors and my attitudes comes out of my subconscious. So habitual patterns, and one of the most powerful things here sitting recorded in me is fear. You know, there are so many fears. Fear is an emotion experienced in anticipation of danger, evil, or pain, whether real or imagined. And so what has happened is that we've got recordings of fear in the past, and because we've experienced it, we overlay on the present. So we start to think, maybe this, maybe that. This is anxiety, fear of the future, fear of outcomes is anxiety. So even the trunk is feeding the branches, is feeding the leaves. Think, 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 think. Can't stop this incessant habitual thinking. And that's why what is feeding the trunk is the roots. The root is my sense of identity. It's my sense of who I am. And really, I would say this is one of the most influential things on all the thoughts you create. The roots take all the nutrients and they end up in the leaves. So really, your sense of identity influences the trunk, the branches, the twigs, and the leaves, the sense of who you are. And quite frankly, if deep down, 
I don't really feel comfortable about who I am. It's going to go right up through my tree and all these thoughts, self-critical, self-dislike, I'm no good, I'm hopeless. Why? Where is it being fed from is the seed. And this is why, you know, to me, when I go deep into my sense of identity, I can actually reprogram my whole thinking tree. And who am I? If I see myself as a set of labels, as a temporary body, if that's who I am, I'm a male, I'm an Australian, I'm this, I'm that, if that's my sense of identity, hundreds of labels, and yet they're all temporary. If that's my sense of identity, it breeds two children. And these two children have an incredibly powerful impact on my thinking tree. One is my ego, my sense of superiority, the part of me that compares with others and always thinks I'm right, I know more, I'm better. But when this ego is really dominating my mind, my sense of identity, that's when a whole range of negative emotions emerge. I feel so easily hurt, insulted, disrespected, not valued, excluded, sensitive. Just think, how much does sensitivity drive your thinking? How much, if I'm criticized, drives my thinking, etc. So what we're beginning to see that when the seed of my identity, I would say, is false, it's going to create a very dysfunctional thinking tree. And the second child of body consciousness, when I think my sense of identity is a temporary body, is a lack of self-respect. And this identity is dominating our world at the moment, I would say, that fundamentally this first relationship in life, me with myself, is so unhealthy. And when that first relationship is unhealthy in 7.5 billion human beings, what sort of planet do we have? There won't be healthy relationships with others. There won't be healthy relationships with the environments. It's very unhealthy. And this I, when it rules, thinks, you know, Others are better. Others don't love me. Others don't respect me. I always have a sense of paranoia and inferiority. And when it, when it sinks into my feelings, I feel so easily, you know, inferior, unworthy. All these sorts of feelings that come inside of me. And so what happens is that when my roots of my sense of self, I would say, are false, it's going to grow a whole false thinking tree. And this is why when we meditate, we're at the root level. We're replacing it with a new sense of who I am, that I am a soul. And I can know that and believe that, and 80% of Australians do. They think I'm something more than a body. The soul is just a point, this micro point, it's consciousness. And the soul sits right in the front of the brain, in the middle, right in the center of the forehead, it's feeling, the feeling is there. I am the soul, this is my body. The soul has forgotten itself. I think I'm a temporary body. And then it produces the game of ego and lack of self-respect. Think, 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 think. And feeling so either superior or more often inferior to others. But when I start to sow the seed of my sense of identity, and when, when I meditate, what am I doing? I'm sitting down. And I'm actually educating myself to know, to feel, and experience who I am. And you know, the 
automatic byproduct when I'm sitting in a state of self-awareness. I'm sitting here. My body is Charlie. My body is a male. My body is Australian. But I think I'm the soul. The whole speed of the mind begins to cool down. There's almost a law that says the more you let go the consciousness of the body, the more your mind cools down and calms down. The more you identify this is me, the temporary me, the, the mind actually speeds up the activity of the mind. I, the soul, this point of life energy, am eternal. I always exist. Immortal, I cannot die. I've lived before this body and I'm going to live after this body. Now, when you sow that, that in the roots of your thinking tree, what it's going to do is that calmness that you create by being connected with who you are starts to influence your subconscious trunk, your mental and emotional patterns, and even your whole conscious mind, your thinking. I can say from my heart, this is my experience. And if I really want to deal with my overthinking, I have to go right down underneath what is visible, underneath the earth, to the roots, and my whole sense of self. And once <clears throat> I was talking to a friend of mine, actually, who used to live up here in the Blue Mountains, who... And he's a medical scientist, and he told me something I've often remembered. And the way he told me, he, he was banging his body like this, his hand. He said, feels solid, doesn't it? I said, yes. And he said, you know, according to science, it's 99.99999% space. And then he went on to say, when you see a molecule, I'm not a scientific person really myself, but... You know, it has a nucleus and an electron going around. It's mainly space. This is made up of molecules. And he said, actually, your body is a hologram. Your body is like a hologram. In you, the permanent self, sit in this temporary hologram, and you're acting out your life through this hologram. The more you begin to know yourself, your whole perception of life changes, even your perception of death completely changes. You know, how much fear and overthinking do we have about the loss of my body, you know, the loss of my identity, etc. But what is the seed? What is the seed that I would say is influencing the roots, the trunk, the branches, the twigs, and the leaves? So from the seed is like a blueprint. And you know, I, I feel that the most powerful thing in life is love. And the seed, I would say, of the thinking tree is love. My observation of myself, and just think in your life, when you feel love in your life, observe your mind. Just to, you feel so your mind is so, it's like you have what you need. You, you don't, you're not always looking. You feel so relaxed, so easy. And you know when you feel that feeling, you offer it to others too. You feel so sort of compassionate and generous to others. But when the mind lacks love, I would say, you know, it can never rest. And really, something's missing. And so it's searching, seeking, looking. And I often feel that a lot of this agitated mind, you know, the mind that's never satisfied, it can never just go, ah. Oh. Because a quality of love is missing in life. And I would say there's probably three sources of love. There's <clears throat> from myself from God and from my family and friends. I would say, just like I was talking before, most of us really struggle, struggle in this first relationship of life. 
So we can't give much love to me. So, and then God, I think a lot of us think, well, you know, we're all different in that department, the department of God. <laughs> we don't know, <laughs> you know, and some are just not sure. So not much love. Even I find personally, a lot of people have faith in God, belief in God, but to really feel loved, like in a real sense, I'm not sure. My one source of love, my family and friends. But if there's a conflict, if there's a loss, it's like my whole world goes into upheaval. You know, what is spirituality? And I think spirituality is, first of all, developing, like in the roots, a loving relationship with myself as a soul. My own experience is the more you do that, the quality of peace, it's like a whole fragrance enters your mind. You have to practice, there's no doubt. But the whole mind, it's a lovely, it's like a fragrance, a feeling in your mind of just coolness and calmness, very sweet feeling. But secondly, spirituality is developing a loving relationship with God. And that is like a constant source of love, if I can say. And I find that if I'm tasting love, true love, quality love in my life, and I know who I am, that foundation changes the whole thinking tree. And on the surface, my mind, I'm, I'm really feeling quite calm about life and myself because I sort of know who I am and I know who I belong to. I feel secure in that place. And you know, we all have a journey with God and that's, I fully, fully appreciate because I've been on one myself. I, you know, <clears throat> grew up in Melbourne and um, I went to confirmation classes when I was 12 or something and quite frankly, I couldn't relate to it at all. So my family said to me, <clears throat> you know, what do you think? And I said, I think I'm an atheist. <laughs> I just couldn't relate. At least I was immature at the time. It wasn't really to do with the people teaching. It was more me. But what I heard was that God was just out there to punish you and give you a hard time. And I thought, I'm out of here. I don't want this stuff. <laughs> but then, you know, as I grew up, I was really looking for something. You know, and I, I don't think I was that unhappy, <clears throat> but I just didn't feel, is this what life is about? So when I was just 20, I wandered the world for some years, and I lived in religious communities in Asia and India, the Middle East, Africa, Europe, all types. And I became an agnostic, I used to say. I don't know. I'm not sure who, you know, maybe there is a God. I was open. And when I was in London, I began to meditate. And I was offered the idea that <clears throat> just as I'm the soul, made so much sense to me. The soul is a non-physical, it's consciousness. Actually, I've lived before. I sit here and I start to act here. Then I forget myself and I take on this whole identity. And I do actions through this body. I reap the fruits of my actions. But God is a soul that's pure, unadulterated never influenced, but a real soul. So not just um, a, you know, an image in my mind or a belief or a doctrine, but a real living conscious soul, but a soul that does not have a body. You could say like a pure soul. So what is meditation? Actually, meditation is communicating with a source of love that's constant. So the seed of my thinking tree now has a constant source, a constant input from a source of real love, not my imagination, absolutely real. You know, you know how you're sitting here and you're listening to this broadcast at the moment. And as you're, as I'm speaking and maybe you're listening People are popping in your head all the time, your friends, your family members. Why? Because they speak or they are this, you know, think of you and you pick up their thought messages. 
You know, thoughts are instant. You, you can have relatives on in Europe or North America. You'll pick it up absolutely instantly. It's just the amazing nature of the mind and consciousness. And you know they're real, but they're living in a body. It's just the same with the supreme soul. It's a real living soul, but a soul without a body. But I can communicate and I can feel those vibrations. And the way I've been thinking about it recently is that, you know, sometimes if I'm really frank these days, I find if you say to people meditate, they say, oh, it's too hard. And I wonder how many of you out there think, have had the same experience. You even come to weekends and you think, great. And you definitely feel better. But to sustain meditation, it's like a mental wrestling match. If you had that mental where you're sort of wrestling with your old thoughts and thought patterns. And the way what we learn here in the Brahma Kumaris is just to remember. And you know, remembering is the most natural thing that your mind can do. At every millisecond you're remembering. <clears throat> you're remembering what you have to do, remembering what happened, remembering what so-and-so said, remembering you have to put on the food. And each time you remember, three things happen. First, you connect. Second, you're influenced by whatever you connect with. And third, you have an experience. So just sort of imagine that here you are, the soul sitting here. You remember a relative, connect. And if it's a good relationship, you download back into your mind good feelings. Then you remember another relationship not going well. You download bad feelings. Then you remember a past incident. You connect, influence, download negative feelings. So you're just constantly, your mind is, the thread is connecting, connecting, and downloading feelings. The logic here is to heal my inner world. I become aware of who I am, and I start to learn how to remember the Supreme Soul. That simple. And I often think if there's love, your heart will automatically follow, your mind will automatically follow. So I begin to just remember the Supreme Soul. And the image is that image behind me, a point. And I, it's like the lover of the soul. You have a soul lover a real, living, conscious soul who's like your friend and your lover. The beauty is the more you remember, you're influenced by the Supreme Soul or God's love, peace, power, and you download that fragrance here in your mind. The more you keep that there, it starts to come through your eyes, come through your face, and come through your actions. We all know that when I'm really loving to the people I love, I'm kind to the people. I, how do you feel? Do you feel good about yourself? If we come under our old nature and we are angry with people we love, we're negative to them, we do things to them that hurt them, how do we feel about ourselves? Because sometimes, you know, our programming, especially in the trunk, there's a lot of negative habits there that just keep popping up and influencing my, my mental and emotional patterns and my thinking. And I do things and say things that I feel ashamed of. <clears throat> but the more I connect, the more I feel strength in that connection, I start to take back the power of my mind. So what am I doing in meditation? I'm creating the thoughts I want. During the day, as I was saying, you hear this person, think, think, think. You see this, think, think, think. The world's driving me. But in meditation, I'm sitting down. And I think, who am I? I'm a soul. And I'm starting to create the thoughts I want. I'm taking back the authority of my mind once again. The more I practice... It's almost like the more I so I build that foundation so deeply in my mind, who am I 
and who do I belong to? That will just move through your thinking tree and the leaves will be such healthy and positive leaves. You have all had the experience sometimes in life, you wake up in the morning, you feel down, you feel bad, and then that energy of feeling bad about yourself or something you've done just goes right through your thinking tree and all your thoughts are negative. And the world looks dark, black, and unhappy. And then I start, that's my reality. I feel depressed. But when I wake up each morning and I fill the sacred space of my mind with these quality thoughts, these positive thoughts, it's going to start to feed a thinking tree which is so completely different. <clears throat> and that's where, for me, and I feel at this time, we have a perfect opportunity to really do the work in meditation, really get myself going well. And not feeling frustrated if I go through a few bad days, but keep going. For me, I think I've meditated every day for the last 45 years. It's not that it's just been like this. No, it's been a journey, go up and down. But when you do the work and you start to really heal that relationship with yourself and experiment with the relationship with the Supreme Soul, a completely different feeling in your mind. And when there's a completely different feeling in your mind, everything begins to work better. So, <clears throat> yes, we can have a few questions if you like. Oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> Actually, um, I'm just being reminded, if you'd like to ask some questions, you can type them. But maybe if you're thinking about them um, or you're just spending a little bit of time, if someone would like to type something, you're most welcome. But we might just have a little bit of meditation. And um, after meditation, if anyone has a question that you'd like to ask, you're most welcome. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> once again, I'd like to invite all of you into this into this room. Just let me observe my thinking tree. What sort of thoughts are floating through my mind? To reprogram the quality of my thoughts, I need to go to the seed and the roots. Who am I? Just visualize yourself as a tiny, tiny spark. The soul the consciousness that sits in the front of the brain, in the center of the forehead. And with this image of who I am, just feel yourself withdrawing from all the labels of your body. They are all temporary. A 
and now I'm on the journey to my permanent self. Just feel yourself sitting so lightly in the center of the forehead. I, the soul, look through my eyes, hear through my ears. I act through this wonderful instrument. I know who I am. Just feel yourself so light, so peaceful, the speed of thought cooling down. And in this state of self awareness, visualize God the divine as a radiant jewel of light. Just see in the eye of your mind the supreme soul, a sparkling point, but a real soul. Feel a connection. Feel I, the soul, linking, connecting with the one who is unlimited in love and unlimited in peace. The more the thread of my mind is in this direction, It's like I live stream peace inside and a purity of love I will find nowhere else. And the more I hold this connection, just observe how the heaviness begins to go. The worry about outcomes, what will happen, the things that happened last week that hurt me, they all have less impact. We are now at a time where there's so much change around us. But if I hold this connection, I can remain stable. I'm influenced by this connection. And not all the change, the comments, the opinions floating all around this world at the moment. To meditate regularly is an act of love for myself. During this time of lockdown, if I sit a few times every day, I stick to them. I won't feel a victim of my mind anymore. I'll start to feel more freedom internally. It's not as difficult as we think.
So thank you, <clears throat> everyone. And if you have time, um, we have a few questions. So um, I'm happy to spend a few more minutes, but I do understand if I'm sure anywhere you're doing <laughs> whatever you have to. So a question. I can repeat it if you like. So the questions are just about to arrive. So thank you so much, Ali Baji. It was so nice and many, many people have joined us uh, with the list live chat and many people are sending lots of love and these thoughts and talk by you are very really uplifting. Uh, but one question we got, how can I encourage someone who has a negative attitude towards God to be able to discover who God really is? <clears throat> How can I encourage someone who has a negative attitude towards God to be able to discover who God really is? <laughs> Such an interesting question. You know, <clears throat> I think we have to respect difference and you know, and that's why I commented during this little talk that, you know, in my life I've been a bit of an atheist. I was pretty young, a bit of an agnostic. But now this is the most important relationship of my life. All I think is just to say to people that just experiment. I think what puts off a lot of people is religion. And I think... People put religion and God together and a lot of people feel quite uncomfortable with institutions of religion and so they just think, well, they're the ones who sort of, you know, <clears throat> talk about God and so on. So it's like a whole package. And I know for me when I separated God from religion and I, I really explored that, it was much more comfortable for me to open myself and even sometimes, not to use that word, because sometimes those images, you know, God, etc., it just presses buttons because it reminds people of sometimes childhood feelings of <clears throat> religious indoctrination and, and these sorts of things. Now, you know, I've lived in all religions. I have friends from all religions. And I have a lot of love and respect for all of them. But I know that it leaves different feelings in, in different people. So sometimes to sort of think, experiment, and open myself. And I think true wisdom is to remain open to new ideas. And so I would just, <clears throat> you know, just suggest to people to try to experiment. And I think that for me in meditation, I really found that when I was meditating and I experienced a connection, it's almost like the light bulb goes off, this amazing sort of connectedness. Maybe even with a human being, when you really feel in love, that connection, you know, it's always in your mind. You feel so uplifted. It makes you feel really good. But this is constant. A human relationship will inevitably have its ups and downs but this is constant and it's real i think a lot of us feel inside oh it's just some lovely idea or imagination i'm actually connecting with a real being and i think i would just say to people just try it you've got nothing to lose and you know I even read recently that still in the world about 80% of people have some feeling for the divine or God. It's quite amazing. It's a part of human life. And many feel that perhaps in the contemporary world where we've sort of moved away from spirituality, it becomes a very dry life. There's sort of not much meaning then on the other hand, a lot of people feel, you know, religion and blind faith, they don't want to, I don't connect, it doesn't make sense to me. 
To me, spirituality is just a natural relationship with God. I don't have to pray. I don't have to do rituals. I'm just, I go about my life with my lover in my mind. Yeah. <laughs> so rather long answer to the question. <clears throat> yes, next question. Thank you. So one more question we have. How can I dictate how I feel when I hear of when I hear of people I know dying during this? Tumultuous this time, time. Am I to give myself permission to grieve and then move forward from them from there? I'm finding this time challenging. Yeah. That's a beautiful question because I think everyone's finding it challenging. It's not an easy time. And, you know, <clears throat> um, it's not easy when people we love pass away, get ill, and yet on another level it's life. The most inevitable thing in life is that ultimately we're all going to pass away. And quite honestly, a part of my spiritual journey I've just loved is to get a real sense of what death is, because I think we have to. To live, we have to also know how to die. And really, I think the more we've become body conscious, we have our perception of death is a big, big, big problem. And I think it exacerbates so much negativity and overthinking. My understanding of life is that I, the soul, enter the womb. I sit in the forehead of a fetus. I'm then born. This is my mom and this is my dad. You know, this is my family. This is my country. These are my friends, then this is my partner, these are my children, these are my grandchildren, this is my job, this is my house. You know, you build up this incredible network around this body. And then in one second, we go. But my understanding, the soul flies on. And what does it do? It goes back into the womb once again, sits in the forehead, it's reborn, says, this is my mom, this is my dad. This is my family. This is my country. We rebuild the whole thing once again because we've forgotten the continuity. What is permanent in all this change? We find change so difficult because we fear the outcome. But when we understand I always exist, but I will change bodies as I move along, I get a whole different idea of death. And sometimes, and I... I don't know how you'll think about this, but I sometimes think when people are suffering so much physically, when the soul is released from the body, it can free itself from a lot of suffering, sometimes mentally and physically. And then it can begin again, once again. And that's my understanding. And I, I feel that the more you know and experience who you are, your whole idea of death completely changes. It's the most inevitable thing. And with a population of 7.5 billion, then, <clears throat> you know, there's always going to be birth, some being born, some passing on. It's a part of life. So maybe... Just one, one more question. question. Okay. Uh, here is Warren Bhais is asking how we can make Baba, which is Supreme Light, Supreme Soul, Supreme Authority, uh, to come alive as a real person in our meditation. Most of the time, Baba or the Supreme Light is just point of light in meditation, but how we can uh, uh, get he can come alive with us, real as in person or mm -hmm. companion? Such another lovely question, because I think, you know, the reason why I, I think sometimes a lot of us feel, yeah, I really, I really connect with this, I like it. 
but I just meditate on a point of light, it's dry. And it's like I have to even study further to really sort of discover the personality. You can only love someone who's lovable. And I think sort of really exploring the that personality, which is, how can I say, has a sort of such an innocence, such a purity, which attracts the heart. And so it's like not just meditating on a point of light, but filling in such a personality of purity, of love, of belonging. And these sort of things really begin to track the heart. When there's relationship, there's natural concentration. And that's why really meditation isn't just this trying to force my mind to concentrate on a point of light. No, I'm falling in love with a permanent lover, a lover that spans life and death. It is, I have relationships with my family. It's lovely. It's wonderful. But they're temporary. This is a real relationship and a permanent relationship. So I'm going to finish up there. And I'd really just like to thank you so much for your time and your patience um, listening and um, Anyway, it's really lovely, even though I can't see you. I can see <laughs> the live chat going on. <laughs> so I know that we're interacting. So thanks from the heart again. So thank you, Charlie, very, very much. And uh, a lot for us to think about and to digest. And, and one thing is that you can listen to this talk for a week on YouTube you can just click on and listen to it again and again, which is wonderful. And you can see Charlie and you can see that whatever he's saying, he lives. He absolutely walks his talk and keep going over it during the week and uh, we'll have more talks every day. Thank you very much, Charlie. Thank you, Sally. It was so beautiful. Thank you, Sally. And thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.